is uh, actually very interesting. I remember some 10 days ago, uh, we had a raw material symposium, and the question was asked whether raw materials resource efficiency had a strong connotation with the financing sector. And there was indeed the response it has. The speaker, the person who asked that question, is actually the speaker for this evening. It's Nigel Jollins, who is uh, principal policy manager at the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And he's in charge there in the area with what is called the Sustainable Resources Initiative. So he's probably the right person to tell us a bit more about financing and raw materials and resource efficiency. Uh, prior to his engagement at the EPRD, he was also at the IEA uh, in charge with energy efficiency policies. He had a background in ecological economics. So I look quite forward to the kind of lecture we appreciate from your side. I see you're still sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to hide. <laughs> Probably it's best if you just Give it a start, over, probably. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I wasn't intending to do it at the back. Um, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Raymond, and thank you to Amy and Alison and other people who have invited me along here. Paul, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I was in Luxembourg this morning, uh, snowing, and here I come back to my hometown now, my hometown in London. Um, to see the nice grey rain made me feel at home, you know. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many people here tonight to hear a topic, talk, a talk about a topic that is pretty dear to my heart. You know, I've been working in this field since uh, 1993. Um, so you do the maths. 20 years, which, okay, not so long. But when I first started, I have to say, I used to go along to parties with my wife and uh, they would ask me what I did for my job, and I said I was an energy efficiency analyst working on monitoring energy efficiency policy, and they'd maybe yawn a little bit and turn to my wife, who was on television, you know, she was a, a political editor for TV, and they'd say, what are you doing? Oh, I recognize you, and I'd be left there twiddling my thumbs, right? But now when I go to parties and I, people ask me what I do, and I'm energy efficiency and resource efficiency, they're like, yeah, cool. And then, but then I say I work for a bank. Then they turn to my wife and I'm left there <laughs> twiddling my thumbs again. Um, so what I wanted to do is, oh, first of all, I'll give you a little bit more background. So I am kind of a strange, I have had a strange career. I've started off working um, in government. I spent 10 years in New Zealand working for the central government in environmental and energy policy. And then I went and did a PhD. So I spent six years as a bona fide ecological economist. Um, and so, any of you familiar with Herman Daly and Bob Costanza and those kind of dudes, yeah? And so I spent some time at the University of Maryland sitting at the feet of uh, Herman Daly, and that's where Bob Costanza came from originally as well, or at least initially. So I have this sort of strange, deep green, uh, her heretical economics background, and then I find myself heading off to Paris to the IEA, and working in a very conservative um, oil security political organization and now working for a bank but still with this kind of ecological stuff going on. Um, so I have some questions that I, I'd like to discuss with you. I, I thought about expounding my theories of universe and energy and resources but what I thought I'd do is I'll tell you what I do and in the institution that I work for and then I've got some questions that maybe we could discuss. But before I go on, just one more question to you. Uh, who, is, who are you? Who's in the audience? Who, how many students are here? Okay, staff from UCL, a few, and others, general public? Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. Any journalists in the room? No, lawyers? No, okay, a lawyer, okay, good, good. Um, so I have to start off with a disclaimer in that case. Uh, so everything I'm going to say is my own take on EBRD and resource efficiency. And Raymond, how long do I have? Half an hour. Half an hour. Right, so finishing at half past, which is 20 minutes, or half an hour from now? Okay. We have a little reception afterwards. Okay. Whatever you want to display, 
also. Okay, cool, cool. <coughs> right, so this is what I'd like to do in the next half an hour, is look at the EBRD. Has, uh, are you familiar with the EBRD? Is anyone here not familiar with the EBRD? You can raise your hand, it's okay, it's okay. It's a few people, so I'll go through that pretty quickly since most people know, and then I'm going to introduce, it's a bit of a cheap trick I know, Rolling Stones, okay, but I'll introduce this take on the Rolling Stones and how they link into the uh, resource efficiency thing, and then look at the resource challenge very quickly, because I know most of you are probably very familiar with this, and then spend most of the time looking at the EBRD's response to um, this emerging resource efficiency resource challenge. And then at the end, these are the things that I'd be interested in discussing with you. The financialization of the, the rhetoric and discourse uh, around the ecological problematic. That's what we used to talk like when I was an ecological economist. We don't talk like that anymore when I'm in the bank. Um, this notion of technology fix, because you'll hear me mention a lot um, technology and financing technology and best available technology. Is uh, the, the technology fix really a fix or is it a, uh, maybe it's a crutch? And then the role of markets because the EBRD is a financial institution whose founding purpose is to promote the transition to this wonderful uh, market economic structure across um, Eastern Europe through to Central Asia, all these, the great unwashed who used to be in um, Soviet, under sort of Soviet system, now are being exposed to market forces. And the idea of the EBRD is we're supposed to help this transition to the market economy. This is some basic information about the EBRD. 30 billion euros in, um, in capital. We did about 9 billion euros last year across nearly, what's that, nearly 500 projects. Um, and we cover 35 countries, Central Eastern Europe, through to Central Asia, Turkey, and what we call the Southern Eastern Mediterranean, SEMED. And the three key principles of the bank, sound banking, transition, and what's the other one? Environmental sustainability mandate, that's right. Okay, we always forget that one. We, we deal with pretty challenging countries, not only because of their political context, but also because of their environmental context. And here's just one snapshot of the kind of countries we deal with, looking at energy, uh, CO2 emission intensity. And these are all of the EBRD countries. And you see where the UK sits, the paragon of virtue here, and China, and look at Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, the most uh, energy intensive and carbon intensive economies in the world. So that's on a energy intensive basis, but resource productivity is also an issue for them. So you can see here EU 15 is up here and where Central Asia and Mongolia sit here on the resource productivity scale. So there's some big challenges and these are just a little couple of snapshots. Okay. That's the EBRD and what we do. We do finance, we help transition to a, a market economy, and we work in really difficult countries. Did I mention private sector? So the EBRD focuses on private sector finance. We don't go in and give money, lend money to governments, which is in the game called sovereign loans or sovereign finance. We do private sector projects. So those 500 projects that we did were all private, private sector, you know, Companies building, I don't know, making windows or glazing or steel plants, whatever. <laughs> okay, here's where we bring in the Rolling Stones. Let's see if this works. <laughs> no. So I can play this here because it's it's worthwhile. Some of you may remember 1964 when uh, the Rolling Stones released their album 12 by 5 and with their lead track, Time is on my side. Unfortunately, this is my cheap trick, right? Unfortunately, I disagree with these great philosophers that time is not on our side. This is the link into this uh, great imperative. You impressed? I think it's quite good, I thought. 
Um, time is not on our side because, and, and we know this in environmental terms in the climate change context, because we have to peak emissions between now and what, 2020 or thereabouts in order to achieve a 450 parts per million goal. We're not going to do that because we're stuck all this capital stock, right? The existing stuff has very long lifetimes which locks us into energy using pathways. It's very expensive politically and financially to rebuild all this capital stock. So the only way that we can really keep that window of opportunity open for dealing with um, come on in, a couple of my colleagues from EBRD coming to spy on me. <laughs> uh, the only way that we can extend this, this window of opportunity to deal with climate change issues is through energy efficiency, right? So that's time constrained response to climate change is very well known in the climate change world. But resource efficiency I think is probably under represented in people's understanding of the, the time pressure that's happening in a very different or a connected space of resource use. So as GDP rises and as the countries in the EBRD region but around the world become wealthier, what happens? Resource consumption seems to be going up, which creates two big concerns that we're thinking about in the EBRD. One is uh, availability of the resources. And secondly, prices are going up and prices are becoming very volatile, right? Which is very disturbing for our economists in their ivory tower who are thinking, my God, this market economy is look, shaking apart. So time is also critical when dealing with resources. Now, just a point that, um, you know, I mentioned this productivity gap in the EBRD. You'll probably say, ah, uh, okay, it's something related to this, can you see that all right? Where the Western countries are essentially exporting their polluting industries from Germany, UK, whatever, over into the East. All right, this is this idea of leakage out of the West of polluting industries. Now that's fair enough and it's, it is true, but what's happened is that these EBRD countries, countries of operation as we call them, have essentially developed some kind of long run um, competitive advantage in polluting heavy industry, resource intensive industries. And this is the real world context that we have to deal with. What should the EBRD's response to this be? Oops, oh yeah, and here's an example. This is, I took this here when I was in um, Veliki Novgorod in Russia. Okay, this is, a, what, why are we concerned about um, resource efficiency because the old capital stock in Russia is so dilapidated and you know this is a, a pumping station that I happen to visit and this is the kind of capital stock that they're dealing with. Anyway, so the question that I want to ask now is what is the EBRD's response to this pressing uh, resource efficiency challenge? And here it is, the Sustainable Resources Initiative. What I'm going to do is, I'll just introduce this very briefly, and then I'm going to focus on something that we've been working on already for a long time, the Sustainable Energy Initiative, because that gives you an example of the kind of business model that we've employed that we think has been relatively effective. And then I'm going to take the lessons from the Sustainable Energy Initiative for uh, how we approach our business in materials and water. Okay, um, now to introduce the Sustainable Energy Initiative, I've got a little video, I don't know if this is going to work, so now I'll play this off here. Um, so, this was produced by our comms people, right, to, to launch our Sustainable en Energy Initiative phase three. So we've been going since 2006 um, and over that period uh, the EBRD has lent uh, about 12 and a half billion euros of, uh, or made 12 and a half billion euros of investment into the EBRD countries of operation. I'll let you watch and I'll
now 12 and a half billion. This was done in 2011. So let me give you some numbers. So that was the Sustainable Energy Initiative, our fancy communications people developed. But this is the real oil, so to speak. So since uh, 2006, our business volume has increased. You can see there about 750 million in one year, up to a peak in 2011 of 2.6 billion in that one year. And the other interesting thing here is that um, the share of this band here, the cleaner energy production, which if any of you have been following the media about the EBRD and its new energy strategy, will notice that this has been the focus of quite a lot of attention because um, there's an issue of financing coal, perhaps. Is anyone here familiar with what's the d debate about that? No? Anyway, so this, is, this includes thermal generation. Now look at this. So it's been quite large and now we see that it's reducing because <coughs> renewable energy is increasing significantly and this thing here, the CEFs, the Sustainable Energy Finance Facilities, has also increased. And this, the CEFs are what we call intermediated finance. It's when we loan to local banks who then on loan to smaller projects. Because for the EBRD, our bankers don't really get out of bed for anything less than 50 million euros or something. Okay, so for smaller projects, we send it to smaller um, banks who then on lend it. Okay, so that's, those are the numbers around the Sustainable Energy Initiative. Here is the distribution. And looking at some of these countries, you might, you'd be uh, forgiven for thinking they're quite difficult countries to work in. In Russia, two and a half billion euros over that period. Um, Central Asia, half a billion. Okay, so we're talking big volumes. In fact, um, if I'm not mistaken, my colleagues at the back can correct me here. I think uh, the EBRD is the largest foreign direct investor in these countries of operation. These guys do the numbers, actually, so they know. Um, so we are the largest foreign direct investor, or thereabouts, in this region. So we you know, have a fair amount of involvement. Um, now, we consider this to be a relatively successful model. And you saw on the video there the, those three triangles. We, we combine three things, and I think this is really important in terms of how we achieve what we've done. Most banks will separate the bankers from the engineers and people like me who work on policy, all right? But at the EBRD, I, I'm a policy person, I work with governments on policy frameworks and I've been embedded within a banking team. So I work every day with bankers who are out there um, working in Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Ukraine, Western Balkans looking for projects in let's say cement plants or factories producing clothing. And they'll come to me and say hey we reckon there's a really big opportunity for energy efficiency or water efficiency in these countries, but the government is not playing ball. It doesn't have the right kind of uh, policy frameworks that are, let's say, consistent with the EU water directive or whatever. So my job is to take that, work with governments, help change the policy framework so that the bankers can do their work. Similarly, the engineers are going out and visiting these plants and saying, you know, the bankers have approached you, or you've approached a bank for a loan to replace your boiler, for example. Do you realize if you not just don't replace the boiler, but also retrofit your pipe system um, and do this, it might cost you another 
2 to 3 percent in terms of the addition on your loan, but you will save such and such amount of money. All right? So you, you could repay this, a payback of one year, half a year, two years. So by working together, the technical people, the bankers and the policy people are more effective at delivering these investments in technology. Um, the other thing is that the banking team that I work in is not a separate team um, with its own targets, but a cross-banking team. So I don't want to lose you here because I can see that we're getting late, right? But this is really important for how we work in that our team um, is responsible for helping all the other banking teams meet their targets. So we have a municipal investment team, we have uh, an agribusiness team, so on. And they are always coming to us because they know that energy efficiency tacked onto their bigger projects will help them increase their business volume. Right? Business volume meaning more finance. Okay, that's enough because you're getting bored, I can see. All right, so um, back to the Rolling Stones then. What, why is all this so important? Because it just so happens that in 1964 again, they released this album and on it has this track, Money, with a very nice line, I think, that says, money can't, um, money, money can't buy everything it's true, but what it can't buy, I can't use. Okay? Point is, money is important. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition. I think that's what they're trying to say. Another cheap trick to get, hopefully wake you up a bit. But let, let's talk about some of the real projects that we've done. I visited this guy in Moldova. He's got a mushroom growing farm and <coughs> he has retrofitted his tunnel houses where he grows these mushrooms and it's now got computer controlled, latest technology, energy efficiency, saving him half a million euros a year. Massive amounts of saving. Mind you, when I was there, the gas supply was, um, he just received a letter that day that the gas supply was being cut off for no particular reason. This is Moldova, right? They want more out of him or something, I don't know. But that's the reality of business. Um, we also do investments in apartment buildings, energy efficiency. This is in Veliki Novgorod. We were involved in assessing this building and seeing what we could do with the external facade and the glazing. Or um, this one in Dushanbe, working with farmers to improve their um, agricultural practices. So the, the investments that we make are very much project based. Okay. Let's see now how we can apply those lessons to the sustainable resource space within the bank. I think I've still got like 10, 15 minutes. Okay. How are you going? You're still with me? Yeah? No one falling asleep? Okay. So, um, applying this, this, this business model, policy, technical, and finance to sustainable resources. And in particular, what I mean by that is energy, which we, we know how to do, two new resources, water, and we, we're calling it materials, but essentially we mean waste minimization. Uh, right, let's have a quick look at water efficiency and the challenges that we face in the EBRD countries of operation. This is from the World Resources Institute Aqueduct. Is anyone familiar with this? Big kind of database of water stress globally. Look at the countries that we work in. Like that. Red meaning highly water stressed. They're some of the most water stressed countries in the world. So there's a really strong rationale for us to facilitate market development in water investments, water efficiency investments. Um, here we go, this technologies thing, right, to facilitate the penetration of best available technologies. This is all out of our sustainable resource initiative document. Um, with a long-term goal of making markets for water, rational water use nonetheless, um, and regulation, through regulation and water pricing, all right. Um, and we have decided we're going to focus on the end user component because the World Bank and the other development banks already have major infrastructure projects in hand. At least that's what they tell us. 
So we're going to focus on end users. So that's the agricultural end user businesses and so on. Quickly uh, look at materials efficiency. Um, because we need to justify our interventions with the bank and all of our projects based on the market failures that they address, we are focusing our attention on some very well-defined market failure areas, all right? Particularly, waste minimization, loss reduction in industry, the conversion space, and waste recycling and reuse. We are not covering um, packaging recycling, and we're not covering the extraction side yet. This is, this is what we were able to negotiate internally as our scope of operations um, within this area called materials efficiency. And for both water and materials, we're going to apply the stock steady business model that we are familiar with. Um, so we've got direct and intermediated finance. We know how to do that in energy. We suspect that we can do it in water and waste. Um, you see the CEFs there, the Sustainable Energy Finance Facility, these intermediated finance, which we have in uh, operating, I think now in 19 countries with more than 50 participating local banks. Um, and new, new, these kind of new instruments uh, ESCOs, energy service companies, which is the great uh, nirvana of innovation in the energy space. So we do finance with technical cooperation where we work uh, with our engineers to extend things like integrating water efficiency into feasibility studies. This is all the nuts and bolts. Boring maybe, but you know, with a bit of rock and roll and rolling stones, it makes it a little more interesting. But boring nuts and bolts of the stuff that the bank does every day and that I've been involved in in the last few months. Um, waste audits, resource efficiency audits, and applying integrated resource management to companies to try and help them understand the business opportunities. Uh, and then where I sit in the policy dialogue, working with governments uh, on this. Now, I think we've got a little bit of time where I can tell you about what we've done to date. So those, those are the water and materials efficiency and what we are planning to do. Let me tell you what we've done in the last 12 months because the Sustainable Resource Initiative was only launched uh, in May of 2013, so it's relatively new. We were given the period from May to December to prove that this thing had some legs and so we've been working on things like defining what a sustainable resource project might be what are the boundaries is um, a project for example i'll pose a question to you all if we invest in a water infrastructure project all right so we completely re, uh, rehabilitate a water infrastructure um, and that uh, results in significant water savings, no leaking pipes and so on, but also leads to huge increases in water consumption. Would you include that as a water efficiency project or not? Because the consumption at the end is much higher than the consumption at the beginning. And yet, so who, who says, yes, that should be a water efficiency project? One person, yeah, two. Uh, who says no? The two people. Come on, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Three people. Okay, Paul. Why? Why would you say it is? No, what you just described is is uh, an example of the rebound effect. Mm -hmm. uh, there has to be good to stop leakage. That has mm -hmm. to be. Uh, mm -hmm. That has to be efficient. Mm -hmm. What you also need to do is something to sort out the rebound effect. Mm -hmm. Probably by getting proper water pricing in, so that mm -hmm. uh, these guys mm -hmm. don't waste stuff at the consumption end. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there is uh, there's certainly an argument to say, particularly in the countries that we're working in, where the water level of service, right, and the, the availability of water to many people was very low. So who's to say they shouldn't have access to better water supply and therefore use more? Okay, who said no? Uh, did you say no or yes? No, you said yes, please. You have, to, you have to look at the whole, as Paul says, the whole system has to be looked at together. Mm -hmm. You can't just fix one bit because pop out somewhere else, the problem will pop out somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Anyone else like that? Yes, sir. Depends on what you started with, whether I use the two or no, 
Yes, yeah, it was, it was low. Yes. Well, I'll tell you what we've decided is that we've decided not to include those kind of projects in here because we want to be seen as being very conservative and not to be showing off that we're doing all these big projects regardless. So at the moment we're tagging them as having a, a water efficiency component, but we're not including them because we don't really know whether we should include them or not. Uh, time will tell. We're trying to be conservative. So that's one of the things we're working on. We've also developed a resource efficiency audit methodology that our consultants will now be forced to use when they go out visiting clients, looking at the potential for an energy efficiency investment, uh, water efficiency, or waste minimization. So there's an audit methodology now that engineers will need to use. So we've done that. We've also revised uh, and had a look at our um, pipeline of projects over 2013. And we've identified 21 signed projects that we consider are robust enough for us to say, yes, that's definitely a water efficiency or a waste minimization. Plus a few more, like this example of water infrastructure um, that weren't, inclu weren't included. And in the pipeline from the end of September through to the end of December, we think there'll be another 13 projects come through. All right, all we've done is add up the number of projects. How we calculate water savings, uh, how much uh, waste is minimized is still a moot point and we're working with Wuppertal, your old colleagues, to help us understand how we'll measure these impacts. Um, let me give you an example and unfortunately I don't have a photo because it's much more interesting to have a photograph. But in Turkey we're working with a liquid aluminium uh, manufacturer and you could, this is the important part, right? So these are the things that we've done, lots of energy efficiency, but we've identified that there's a significant potential for water savings. This is a real project, right? EBRD's lending them 30 million, uh, of which all of it we count as um, SEI, SRI, because it's all either energy efficiency or water. It's going to lead to these energy savings, and here's the water savings, 146,000 cubic meters per year. A real project um, that we think merits being called um, SRI. So, I think that's it. Oh, this, okay, so a little bit, this is the last slide. So now we're integrating sustainable resource initiative components into our intermediated finance. So we're we uh, have a, um, a credit line facility that we are working on in Tajikistan for irrigation water efficiency for um, farmers. We have a credit line facility with the TSKB, which is the development bank in Turkey. And that's a, you know, so we lend them money, they do smaller projects. Uh, we have worked in the municipal sector to try and improve and expand their, um, their ability to capture water efficiency and waste minimization by um, incorporating sustainable resources in feasibility study. Yeah. Um, energy and natural resources is our bucket that we capture all of our power and um, resource investments and we've worked with them about how they would identify water efficiency measures and um, investment opportunities in their sector and manufacturing and services. We've already talked about the, the audit. And we are uh, following, hopefully, board approval, and I'm in the process of documenting all the work we've done over this year so that we go to the EBRD Board of Directors uh, early next year. We'll get endorsement, hopefully, to continue and roll this out properly as a fully-fledged business area. Um, so there we go. This is what I've covered talked about the EBRD and its country of operation, We've looked at uh, the Rolling Stones. Are they right or wrong? I think they're wrong on the notion of time is on our side. They're not. We have very pressing issues. The EBRD's response to that is um, to have set up these initiatives which use what we think are quite simple but innovative business models that have been uh, very effective, leading to 12.5 billion or thereabouts of investment in energy efficiency in very challenging environments. We've extended that now to the resource efficiency area. And um, here we go, look at this. 
So if you, um, if you doubt me about whether time is on our side, maybe we should just put that up. <laughs> uh, right, so that's, that's it from me. Um, I thought it would be useful to talk about these things, but I'm happy to take any questions or not. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much indeed. That's been terrific. I got it that some 12 billion euro have been invested and the tendency is increasing. Nevertheless, a challenge is to identify projects from a bank's perspective mm -hmm. that meet your requirements. And having a screening process, having an assessment process, identifying those projects and eventually also rejecting some that look mm -hmm. interesting at a first glance but then don't meet all the criteria. That's certainly a sort of everlasting challenge. So time is now for Q&A. We now have like half an hour time for discussion, followed by some drinks upstairs. Floor is open. Yes. Uh, feel free to identify yourself. And then what? So my, my question is when, when uh, you develop this initiative, um, did you consider also providing funding to the, to the service providers? Because that my experience... Uh, Which service providers? Can you be more specific? Service providers that provide actual services uh, in terms of, uh, for instance, the water projects and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. Not only to the, to the companies that mm -hmm. implement these projects, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. to the service providers themselves. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking of municipal companies no, or... Like, like, like a national company. Like a national company. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, sure, sure. So I mentioned ESCOs, right? Energy service companies. Um, and we are also looking to see if we can f uh, finance Wesco's water efficiency service companies. Um, and it's very complicated fin financing these people or these companies because they tend to be small companies with small balance sheets. God, I'm sounding like a banker, don't I? So what that means is they don't have many assets, which means they can't borrow much. So if they do something like, let's say they come in here to the college and say, you know, we're going to retrofit your lights for you and we'll pay all the capital cost. All you have to do is pay us back from the energy savings by putting LEDs through all this, which they're not, right? What are they, eight mil tubes or something? So it's a little old. There's some LEDs there. All right, so they'd come through and they'd do all this. So they would go out and borrow, let's say, 100,000 pounds to pay for the uh, LEDs, come and install them, and because your energy costs have gone down, you would pay the difference to this company. Problem is this company now has exhausted all its ability to borrow, so it can't go out and do another project, okay? Yeah? So what we are doing is, this is getting into details of finance, but what we're doing is setting up what are called forfeiting funds. Forfeiting funds basically buy the receivables from the ESCO, so the ESCO bundles together this project with UCL in this building and comes to the fund and says, we've got a stream of income of 50,000 pounds a year, we'll sell this to you for, I don't know, 100,000, whatever, okay? So that means the forfeiting fund receives the receivables, the ESCO company gets some cash then to go out and do another project, okay? Because their balance sheet is released from the debt. Does that make sense? So the answer is yes. That's what I was trying to say, but it's complicated. Yes? I've got so three questions. Mm -hmm. Do I need a pen to write them down? Or? No, you don't have to do that. Right. Also, does the bank finance our percent? Never. The loan? Never. Do you always want some local participation? Yes. We're AAA sort of 30% 30, 30 maximum. So you've got to have 30% local participation? No. The bank will fund 30%. And the rest, the project sponsor needs to find 60%, 60, 70%. Second, if yeah. you've got an ESCO set up with a municipality, yes. and there is a group of those, yes. would you consider funding that as a whole? The group of what? The municipalities or the ESCOs? Uh, ESCOs with municipalities with a potential of 40, 50 million. Yes, the answer is yes, we would consider it. And thirdly, how risk averse is the bank? Very. Would you look at <laughs> I mean, would you look at relatively new technology no. that can bring a game changer? No. Right. The, the bank, I was about to say, the bank is uh, AAA 
can you help me here? Triple A rated stable. Okay. So we're one of the few banks left in the world with that credit rating and you don't get that credit rating for taking risks on new technology. That being said, you know, if there's good technical due diligence that you've got evidence to show that this piece of hardware is going to deliver, um, then the bank would consider it. But we're very risk averse generally. However, you know, entering into the energy efficiency space was considered by many, certainly by commercial banks, as a ridiculous proposition from a banking perspective. So in that sense, we're not risk averse. Do you look purely at renewable resources of energy, or would you look at some of the alternatives, such as coal bed methane? Yes. You would? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you, Nigel. I'm, I'm Paul Ian uh, from uh, UCLISR. Um, I too have three questions. Uh -huh. um, you'll be familiar with the kinds of publications from uh, well, McKinsey at the global level and mm -hmm. Dean Hollins at the UK level mm -hmm. that have computed the potential yes. cost-effective mm -hmm. energy and resource efficiency. Talking MAC curves here, well, are we? Sometimes they derive from that, sometimes they derive from more kind of bottom-up studies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but, but whatever. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, have you computed that potential? Mm -hmm. And uh, how easy is it mm -hmm. actually to find mm -hmm. these projects? Mm -hmm. Because talking to people at the Green Investment Bank mm -hmm. about energy efficiency, mm -hmm. that's easily their most challenging area, mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. to find mm -hmm. fundable projects. They've got the money, they want to roll it out, yeah. but they can't find them. Yeah. So yeah. number one. Yeah. Can we deal with that one first, I'm going to forget it otherwise. Um, so have we done a potential study? Um, a rudimentary one. We have people on the ground who are walking around, you remember that uh, pumping station I showed you with leaking water. They're seeing this all the time, they're saying there's a hell of a lot of potential there. We've done back of the envelope estimates but that's all. We've relied on McKinsey principally with their report released this year, right, on resource efficiency, which was one of the things that stimulated the bank into entering this um, space. So we haven't done our own work. Secondly, um, originating projects is always a challenge. The advantage we have is that we have this mix, as I said. We've got engineers and bankers who are in the field all the time. How many regional offices, do we have 34, 40, something like that, around the EBRD region, where the bankers are talking to potential clients all the time and looking for deals. Um, the energy efficiency component is a little easier for us in our countries of operation because there's such a huge gap. The, the infrastructure and the capital stock is so poor and so inefficient that there's a huge energy saving, so the paybacks are, are much more attractive than here, say. Next question. Um, business models. Yes. You talked about your ESCOs. Yes. Which I know uh, have been around as an idea for Forever. a very long time. Yeah. To, they tend not to work except yes. at, at a high commercial level yes. in Western countries. Yes. Are there other business models that you're working with? Mm -hmm. Do ESCOs work much better mm -hmm. in the kinds of countries mm -hmm. that you're operating in? Yeah, the, the ESCO business model is a challenging one. We've poured lots of technical assistance money into the ESCO thing. You know, this is, so energy service companies and this thing I was talking about, forfeiting funds and so on. That's what we're talking about. Um, we are particularly focusing our work on ESCOs in the municipal space for two reasons. One, municipalities in our countries of operation have reached what's called a debt ceiling. Okay, they can't borrow anymore. Um, who was telling me about a city that they were in in Romania? Yesterday, a colleague of mine came and told me that a city in Romania had spent an entire year's budget by February. <coughs> what the hell does it do? You know, it can't repair roads, can't pay teachers. What? The only way they can do get any extra cash is through these off balance off balance sheet financing escos so that's where we're finance, that's where we're focusing our attention is escos for municipalities and we're we're getting there but it's very very challenging we've got a good progress in romania and bulgaria um, so we, we are and we also have some escos we signed our very first esco deal in russia last year um, with an italian esco who's going in and dealing with uh, big corporates industry. Are we dealing with, are we looking at other 
business models, absolutely. Um, are we having any more success in those new ones? No. It's very challenging. Just a quick Hang on, Paul has one more, or is it on the ESCO model? No. No. Well, come, okay, well. And, and my last question is to yes. do with policy reform. Yes. I bet lots of those, com those, com those countries subsidise energy. Oh, yes. I bet lots of them don't charge for water properly. Yes. Uh, which means that the payback periods in yes. do are much uh, yes. worse than they ought to be yes. uh, if things were properly priced. Yes, do indeed. Do you get into policy reform? Yes. Do you about that? Uh, yes. Does anyone listen to you? No. <laughs> we, we do. <laughs> that, I was being flippant, but that is the case. I'm working in Kazakhstan a lot at the moment, and, well, you say they don't pay. They don't even meter energy or water, okay? Because they, in the residential sector or in the industrial sector, they're based on old Soviet norms. Square meters, therefore you must pay this amount. Um, so we were trying to negotiate with the government about installation of meters and proper, good, rated asset base uh, tariff reform. It's too politically sensitive. Which country recently, Kyrgyzstan was it, recently had uh, riots as a result of the attempt of the government to introduce full market pricing for energy. It's very, very politically sensitive. Nigeria, right. Not your country, yeah, no, no, but it's a very, very challenging area and you've hit it on the head. And without that, they are holding themselves back. We can't do business. We try to talk to them about mitigating price rises by putting in place social programs, splitting the policy, all the stuff that they should be doing, but it's also an instrument of power, okay? Uh, but good question. I think there was one, sorry. Not three. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I can answer that one first if you like, yeah. Um, so our projects can range from very small microfinance, where we do it through intermediaries, through very large. Um, my colleague across the hallway from me um, was responsible for the largest energy efficiency loan in the world, I guess, 500 million or thereabouts to a, um, a Russian steel company. So they can be very big, yeah. Um, secondly, uh, I guess for the audience, well, do, does your bank really have the resources to make uh, a very large change in a country? Mm, does it have resources? You know, no, I mean, even though we're the largest foreign direct investor in the region, we're still a drop in the ocean. Uh, the World Bank is pumping much more than we are into uh, many, many other areas. We do, what have we done in Russia? Two and a half billion over six years or thereabouts um, in an econ a huge economy. So we like to think that we punch above our weight, but you know, to be realistic, we, when we turn up in a country, when I turn up in a country, we can meet with ministers and so on, um, and they may listen to us or they may not. Yeah, but that's a good question on influence. It waxes and wanes depending on how much they want out of us. <coughs> Just like to question your metrics. Yes. Earlier on, we had a, a slide where you were talking about investing 25 billion euros mm -hmm. to save 25 million tons mm -hmm. of CO2, mm -hmm. which is a fixed investment of mm -hmm. roughly mm -hmm. 1,000 euros per ton per mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Mm. that the UBRD makes that investment. Is it directly to save CO2 mm. or mm. is it indirectly? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's the indirect result to save CO2, but actually the return is for something else, for energy efficiency or mm. some other purpose? Yeah, yeah good question. Um, so we are a bank, first and foremost. So the primary objective is to finance bankable projects. So that's number one. That has to have a good internal rate of return. has to be bankable. If it doesn't have that, you can forget it, even if it's going to save huge wax of CO2. So secondly, then they would, if it's a good bankable project, and it's possible for us to put 
climate change mitigation or adaptation or whatever, tack that onto the project, then yes, we would do, we would consider it for, and we would evaluate that component based on its internal rate of return again. Now, you've hit um, a bit of a sore point for us um, because when we started in 2006, we were doing um, a, a ton of carbon abated for about, uh, I don't know, 20 euros or thereabouts. And then over time that has gone much more, it's become much more expensive. Um, and the reason for that is because when we started we were doing uh, many more projects in the big power sector. So retrofitting a thermal power station saves huge amounts of CO2 and it's a very big project, okay? So you get great big savings with just a single project. Now we're focusing much more on more challenging projects like energy efficiency in residential apartment buildings, which is very diffuse, quite expensive, huge transaction costs. And so obviously our uh, euros per tonne of CO2 abated has gone up as well. It's becoming more expensive. And we've been criticized by our own board about this and uh, our response is, well, the internal rates of return are there. Yes, it's more expensive, but we're being told by all of the researchers, the whole research community, that energy efficiency in buildings is critical to address the climate change. But is it interest. a side effect? Or is, there, is it your principal concern to save CO2? No, 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 it's not our principal concern. So it's, a side it's a side effect that people like myself working in this space cajole and work with our bankers to get them to include it in their deals. But they don't care. The bankers don't care about CO2. So this is a policy issue within the EBRD that listen to it. It's uh, it. Yes, however, there is a, um, a good thing that the EBRD has done is that each banking team has a target for sustainable energy investments. So 25% of their business volume has to have a sustainable energy component, right? So at the end of the year, they count up what they've done and if they've done 100 million, 25 million of that has to be on sustainable energy. So there's an incentive for the bankers to get a sustainable energy component. The bankers don't necessarily care about carbon abated and so on, but the incentive mechanism is there. What about that water project we took a couple of slides back? Yeah. Was the water saving again a secondary? Secondary. Yes. Is it very strange? Isn't it? No, because we're talking about a bank and a Still, what's the policy objective within the EBRD? Transition to a market economy through bankable projects. So it has nothing, that sustainable resources is not a policy? Objective. Well, no, that's not true because it's a hierarchy, right? It's a hierarchy, but also we have, uh, the bank has um, developed its understanding of what is a transition to a market based economy. What does that mean? Can you have a transition to a market based economy with um, uh, with a high carbon intensive industry that's polluting. No, you cannot. And so that's a very clear policy statement. All right. Can you have a, uh, a transition to a market-based economy, right, a sustainable market-based economy, with um, uh, inefficient use of resources? No, you cannot. Okay. However, the bank's primary objective is to do investments across a range of areas that promote transition. So the CO2 mitigation is just one of many. Uh, gender issues are also uh, considered. Um, health and well-being, et cetera, et cetera. But primarily, it's about getting bankable projects that have good internal rates of return. But good, good to press because, you know, this is something that we're struggling with every day. What does it mean? For tr what does transition mean? Is this really core to the business of the bank? How, how are we going for time? Um, we still have a few minutes, then we are up to some time. Uh -huh. So we are now, well, I would suggest we finish in like 15 minutes or so from now here, then we go out, have wine, and uh, whatever needs to be said, mm -hmm. still can be then done sure, there. Sure. But I would like to encourage everybody to be short, especially those who have raised their voice, so that's the two of you, and then we have two people more here on this side, including the last question from my side. So okay. first, so yeah. I just want to ask, so this is resource efficiency, yes. economies of scale. 
for economies of scale? What do you mean? Uh, by investing in them, they build economies of scale and hence are more efficient in how they use the resources. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Prepared, no, I'm not really following you. Maybe we could talk about it after. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, very briefly. So, now I am, uh, as a bank, you're mostly involved in you know, debt. Yes. So, uh, but you also have, uh, I think, a small equity, equity arm. Yes. So do you work with, uh, with this equity arm on like, providing equity? Yes. Could you. Businesses? Yes. So Could you identify. A bit more yes. Could you identify yourself, please? Who, who are you and where are you from? Um, I'm Bulgarian. Yes. Um, no, no, which company or whatever, uh, organization? Yeah, I'm currently a part time student uh, with UCL. Uh huh, okay. Uh, yes, and. Uh, you sound like an investor or something, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my background is um, I've, I've been working in, in, in direct investments in private equity. Yeah, okay, sounds like it. Good. <laughs> so, no, no, but okay. So the answer is yes, we, have, we can do debt or equity. Um, depending on what the risk profile is for the company and what our exit strategy is and all those other banky things that they, the bankers okay, think about. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. 30% exposure maximum. Okay. Uh, who is on the New Zealand Institute? Yes. Uh, who's already touched on this slightly in terms of your influence on policy? Yes. Uh, but I wonder if you Stories to us where you've Sure. Yeah. Well, let me tell you about success stories, the lessons you can work out for yourself. Um, so, I can talk about things that I've been involved in. That's the easiest. In Russia, for example, um, I'm involved in a large Jeff funded project, Global Environment Facility. Um, promoting energy efficiency in residential apartment buildings. So this Veliki Novgorod photo that I showed you. And the, the, the problem goes something like this. In 1991, oh, here we go, we've got someone from Bulgaria so who's familiar with this. In 1991, with the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, apartment buildings were privatized, basically given to occupants, okay? But the property rights over the um, common areas was never resolved. Okay, you're familiar with the problem, yeah. So. We, many people have tried to resolve this over 20 years. There's a big problem in Russia in that the um, uh, constitution says you can't force anyone to join or be part of um, an organization. It's a throwback from being forced to be in the Communist Party, I guess. So how do you deal with a problem where you've got to finance and repair these residential apartment buildings where there's no legal entity that you can rely on to lend to, okay, a homeowners association, condominium association. You can't force people to set up condominium associations in Russia. So we were part of a, a law reform that resulted in December of last year, the law on capital repairs, which essentially, it's not ideal, but essentially raises a tax on all occupants of a residential apartment building complex to put money into an account to uh, save money, which is then used for capital repairs. So that's one thing that I think has happened. It's um, at the moment is regulated as five rubles per square meter, so it's very low because of the um, lot of low income people in Russia, but it's forcing people to think about their dilapidated buildings, leaking roofs, falling down door, windows broken, and so on, where there's no money available. That's one thing. Second thing, uh, another one in Russia, um, we take for granted, at least I hope we all do, our energy efficiency standards for our refrigerators and those kind of things. And when you go to buy one, you'd be familiar with the label that tells you how efficient it is. And I'm sure all of you will make your decisions based on how many uh, stars or whatever on your refrigerator, right? Yes, exactly. Whether it's A or G, whatever, A triple plus. But in Russia, there is no such labeling. So um, I used a very small grant from Finland to establish, I eventually gave up on the government and we established a voluntary endorsement label that is now in the market in Russia for a range of products that is, uh, I handed over to a business association and they're running it. In fact, the very first board meeting is next week. 
that's another. I could give you many more. Waste management in Turkey, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we, I think we make a make some influence, have some influence, and have lots of success in the policy area. That sounds good. So, when you talk about the technology fixes, yes. Can you, do you monitor all the technologies developing and when they're coming on stream? No, I think. We, we have engineers whose job is to be familiar with what's the latest and greatest in the market, but I wouldn't say they would be looking for, you know, the most, you mentioned, you know, the new technologies emerging that uh, are not tested. So, but, I mean, you know, they're always open to receive information about new technologies. We rely a lot on um, the EU BREFs, the best uh, reference technologies. Uh, I don't know, I can tell you about those later if you like, but that's where we tend to get most of our intelligence from. Um, well, the old question which um, I have uh, is actually inspired by one of the discs, uh -huh. uh, the Rolling Stones. Uh, the title is Teal Wheels. Uh, it came out some 20 years ago. And uh, to me, what I've learned is that you indeed have a strong focus on where you could have the low-hanging fruits potentially in parts of manufacturing industries. You do what the Germans do in the material efficiency program, what the UK does in the knowledge transfer network, and then you go out to the steel producing, aluminium producing companies, and then convince them to do the immediate direct uh, based minimization water efficiency route. Mm -hmm. uh, however, it's interesting when you look at steel production in general, steel wheels, what matters in terms of resource efficiency usually is the application of those materials, which is the value chain component. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would require that you bring together actors and ask them, design a product which is more resource efficient mm -hmm. and then ask the producer of that material mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. contribute to it. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, I learned that you do it in the housing building sector mm -hmm. a bit. Yes. Uh, so could you potentially consider that the EBRD also plays a role in eventually establishing intermediate scouts that bring together actors along the value chain, say in steel production, mm -hmm. so that you have a stronger radar on where the steel is used, the applications, it could be construction, mm -hmm. could be makers, that you have a stronger view also on how the scrap is produced and recycled, so that you have a sort of a full fledge of that steel wheel or of other yes. application of material flows. Would that be part of, say, the mm -hmm. next or the next after generation of the kind of Sustainable resource initiative? Possibly, if it led us to be able to finance improvements in supply chain efficiency. And this is something we've talked a about internally. The challenge is, so we're always thinking about how we would finance um, pro a project like that. Who would be the borrower? Um, and one example that we're thinking about at the moment is a, an insulation manufacturer. So an insulation manufacturer might be the key borrower, but they would be responsible then for liaising with architects, with the engineers, with the construction companies in that whole value chain of the construction of a building to procure highly resource efficient services, yeah? including selling their own uh, insulation material. But it's very challenging because you have to find one person. So that's on the project side, but I suspect you were hinting at whether there we would have an interest in someone doing analysis and providing us with analysis. Is that right? Possibly. Only the a, scouting system. a scouting system for projects, yeah? Yes, a scouting system for projects, yes. If it really could deliver projects, rather than just reports on potential or that sort of thing. Sure. Right? Because this is a, a bank that wants projects. You need to talk to the people about yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. We can conclude this part of the session. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We finish this part with a quote of a great philosopher, and you see the face right behind me. Uh, and the quote is uh, Let's drink to the hard working people, let's drink to the soul of the earth. 
So we have some drinks upstairs, and you're all invited to join us there and have a last chat with Nigel or Mondo Thanks very much for your participation. Very good.